We're ready? <laughs> All right. So, usually Friday, Saturday time frame, I begin to ask God what he wants for this service. And um, this past weekend, I thought we were probably going to be going in a certain direction, and I was uh, had my notebook there, and I was doing my usual prayer journaling, scribing for the Lord, and the Lord um, broke in. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just starting, and I was questioning, I was asking, what do you want to do? What do you want to say to these precious women this next week? And he said, he just broke in on me and he said, I have something to say. <laughs> and, and he does that to me every now and then. As soon as he says that, I grab my pen and I'm ready to write. So he says, this is what Jesus said. Focus on purity, holiness unto the Lord by your actions, by your deeds, by your activities, and by your thoughts. By your actions, by your deeds, by your activities, and by your thoughts. Says, Focus on purity and holiness unto the Lord. So, you know me, I immediately began to research. Purity in the Hebrew is A-C-N-E, and a little slant over the top of it, um, which our typewriters won't do. So, but is hutnia, hutnia, purity, hutnia. And it means innocence, it means modesty, which got thrown out the window a long time ago. Modesty, virtue, brightness, brightness. Purity makes you bright. Why? Because you're not loaded with sin. <laughs> you can shine, you can just shine. Webster says, well, actually, Webster's gave me a very interesting uh, comment on it, uh, an example. This is a sentence. Struggling to live a life of purity while surrounded by wickedness. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we can aim at that a different way. We don't have to struggle to live for God if we just simply are close to him. It's not a struggle to live a pure life if you belong to Jesus Christ. If the blood of Jesus is running through your DNA, you're going to be loyal to him. He's in you. You're in him. He's not wicked on any count. There was never sin in him. And therefore, he will regroove your thinking. He will change the way you're looking at things. He will change your hearing. He will renew your mind for his purposes that you may live a holy life. And it isn't a struggle, it's a joy because it keeps you free. And the freer you are, in, in holiness and purity, the stronger you will be in the Lord. The clearer your vision will be of things in the spirit. Now that doesn't become your religion. That doesn't become your religion. We are focused on Christ. He is our holiness. Holy Ghost is inside of us. He is our holiness. But he's teaching us and training us. And I don't know about you, but I know when I first came into the kingdom, half a century ago, the Lord immediately began to teach me. And he gave me something that really helped me. Really, I know me. I was just a young mother, three little kids running around. And I was trying to find my way in what I had just received of Jesus. And I was right in front of a mirror in my bedroom. And he said, from now on, just ask me if that's what I want you to look like. Whether you're going to church or going to the supermarket. Whether you're just going out in your backyard. Is that what I want you to be dressed like? Now that is not a religious in slavery, that is freeing. I never had to think about a wardrobe again, I just got the things Jesus wanted me to have. <laughs> and it becomes an incredible 
liberty, when you live for him. It's not a bondage. I mean, people that are mixed up or still have mixture of the world in them, they think, well, that's just bondage. And that's because our whole world worships themselves. Yes. yes. They are their own God. And so what they're doing must be okay, right? No. <laughs> it's not right. So God in his love for us starts changing us. He doesn't do it all at one time. He told me one day, he said, just go through this house and throw away anything that I tell you needs to go. He said, don't question it, let it go. And so I started doing that and I found that my prayer time greatly increased. We had lived all over the world. We're military people. We had picked up all kinds of stuff. He just said, that goes, that goes, that goes. I don't care what you pay for it, that goes. And if you, I remember a Korean sister saying to me one time after they had come to Christ, she had this huge, they had, they had money, she had this huge emerald Buddha mm -hmm. in their living room. And the Lord, and it was big, I mean it was big. And the Lord said, that has to go. And she said, and he said, and you can't give it to anybody. Oh, Amen. Oh, yes. So you know what she did? It's so funny. She cracked me up. She had a baby. And she went and got all the poopy diapers, got a garbage bag, and put that statue and all those poopy diapers <laughs> in there. And nobody would open it. Nobody would touch it because it was stinking. <laughs> and that's the way she got rid of her boot. Oh, funny. <laughs> But it takes the Lord in you and your desire to serve him to be willing to let go of the things of the world. Amen. And so sometimes in counseling with people and being a pastor to people, all we can do is encourage them, fall in love with Jesus and let the Holy Ghost in you teach you what you can and cannot do. Because we are different. There's some things some of you can do that I can't do. And there's some things I have liberty to do that you don't have to do. We are answerable to God. Amen. But the things that we can do will all be within the confines of Scripture. And the Holy Spirit will be able to point that out to you. And the main thing is that everything you do is an act of faith and love. Does love tell you to do that? Does faith in Christ tell you to do that? So... We are not just average people. When we gave our lives to God, the king took residence. Now, how much residence the king has in you is up to you. Once you've invited him in, if you're not taught or you don't have the desire to follow after him, you won't grow. You're saved. You'll go to heaven one day but you're not really serving him because that desire is not in you yet. So it's not enough to just get people saved. We want them filled with the spirit. We want them to have a passion for Christ. And one of the things we've been doing for eight weeks is stirring ourselves up again because for the past year, we've been under wraps and we've been under covers and all this oppression is everywhere and the darkness seems like in the world, it just keeps getting worse. So how do we walk as free women of God in a real world? You're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to choose it. You're going to have to stand on the word and declare it's true. And you're going to have to come into meetings like this where the power of God and the energy of God is flowing and keep yourself rejuvenated. God never meant for us to be isolated from one another. He wants us to have fellowship and to learn and to grow together with him. All right, the Lord's word instructs us and the spirit guides us to victory. Paul instructed Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one despise or think less of you because of your youth, but be an example, a pattern for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Every single one of those things is important to holiness. Go over them again. Speech, 
conduct, love, faith, and purity. I mean, sometimes you can say the right thing with the wrong attitude. That's what gets us in trouble more than anything else. I said, well, Lord, I'm speaking the truth. Uh -huh, but where's your heart? Where's your heart in what you're saying? Especially you have to watch out for this in your marriage relationships and with your kids. It is on the home front where you can get bombarded the worst and where you can have your worst critics. And they're up close and in your face. And you can almost come under the influence of that. Well, they must be right because they're all in agreement, right? <laughs> no. you got to live for God. you got to live for God. My husband, before his death, they said, one thing he would testify. He said, I've lived with that woman for decades. And I'm telling you, she loves Jesus more than she loves me. And she lives the life. Nobody knows her like I know her. She lives the life. I praise God for the testimony. Yes. I would always tell him, but honey, you're second. <laughs> Somehow a military officer doesn't think that's too cool. He doesn't want to be second. He wants to be saluted, and there you go. But it was true. And he finally told me, shortly before he died, he came by me one day. And he, he would have a way of just slapping me on the shoulder. He just slapped me on the shoulder and he said, I want you to know, I'm not jealous of Jesus anymore. <laughs> that was a big thing for my husband. Yes. I'm not jealous. And I started to say, well, it only took you 40 years, but I didn't say that. <laughs> Thank God. Sometimes women keep your mouth shut. Yes. <laughs> Thank God for what you got. <laughs> All right? And let it run because God's teaching them and the more he comes into them the more he'll come into our situations Philippians 4 8 for the rest brethren whatever's true whatever's worthy of reverence honorable seemly whatever's just whatever's pure whatever's lovely and lovable whatever's kind and winsome and gracious if there's any virtue or excellence if there's anything worthy of praise, think on, weigh, and take account of these things and fix your mind on them. The Lord has promised in Isaiah, if our minds are stayed, if our hearts and minds are stayed on him, we'll be at perfect peace. So what's our problem? What's our problem? Well, number one, maybe you need to shut off the TV some. Maybe you need to shut off the radio some. Maybe you need to not read that particular article unless the Lord's telling you to read it so that all of that doesn't keep bombarding you. We live in an evil day, but we must not focus on the evil. The Lord is very, very direct here. I mean, Paul is making it very clear in Philippians 4, 8. These are the things you think about. These are the things you operate in. That's enough in there to keep us busy for a lifetime. Let's put our mind on those things things. If we need wisdom in these other areas, because we have focused on this, we will have the wisdom of God to deal with anything that comes to us and any person that comes to us. We're accountable to do this. See, God has his accountability and he'll never fail, but we have accountability too. So let's look at holiness for a moment. Because the Lord mentioned both words, purity and holiness. Holiness in the Hebrew is Kodesh. G-O-D-E-S. Sacred, consecrated, dedicated, set apart. Set apart. It's something only God can give. Man can't work it up. Man can't fast for 40 days and do all this kind of stuff like the Hindus do and the Buddhists do and think that he's getting more godly. He's serving a false god. You can't do things to earn holiness. You obey the word and you walk in love and faith and holiness becomes, it saturates into your being. You'll find there are movies you can't watch. 
at this point in time, there's advertisements you can't watch. Yeah. The less that thing is on, the better off you're going to be. But watch what God wants you to watch. Do what God wants you to do. Sacred. Sacred. Consecrated. Dedicated. Set apart. Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? First Chronicles 16, 29. Ascribe to the Lord. Give it to him. Verbalize. It's his. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. That's what we just did in worship. Bring an offering and come before him and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness and in holy array. In holy array. I mean, you prepare yourself. You prepare yourself to come before him. I mean, even early in the morning, I prepare myself to come before him. I'll spend time in the word, time in my devotions before I actually get in my altar. I prepare myself to come before him. But I'm not just talking about our devotional time. Because, and, and don't get religious on that, I, I do come to God in the morning in my PJs, okay? <clears throat> or my nightgown, I do. He's not offended by that. No. But I do brush my hair, and I, I do put myself together a little bit, and I'll drink a little bit of hot tea to wake me up. <laughs> God doesn't mind. He knows I'm coming to be with him. And he knows that's the only thing that matters to me. And even every morning, I take my devotional time in the order God tells me to take it. Because some days he wants me to do different things. And I'll do what he wants to do first, and then I may do my routine. Or I may not have any more time to do my routine, and I'll just maybe catch it in later in the day. The important thing about serving God is serve God. He's your father. The Lord Jesus Christ is your elder brother. Holy Ghost is your best friend. Don't ignore the family. <laughs> Listen to what they're saying and take their embrace every day. Goodness knows we need to kiss the face of God every day. I literally picture myself doing this. When I take my prayer shot, my prayer to leave, on the, the writing, uh, Lord God, King of the Universe, you've commanded me to wrap myself daily in the, in the tulip. The center is for the Father, the right side is for Christ, the left side is for Holy Spirit. And I kiss that band in reverence, and I hold it up against me as though God's hugging me. Then I get involved. Being a widow, being alone in a house, it's a different way of life. You've got to have fellowship. And if we have fellowship with God first, all other fellowship is taken care of. Amen, Elizabeth? Yes. We're learning these things. So, holy array is really in reference to our heart attitude. Don't go to bed upset. Don't ever go to bed upset. Keep yourself awake long enough to deal with whatever you need to deal with and go to bed in peace and get up in peace. The word talks about this. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. If there's a situation, you take time, in fact, the Lord's told me, he said, anytime you get out of peace, somebody kind of rattles you a little bit. He said, don't keep trying to work your way through all of this. He said, get along with me, even if you have to go run, use the bathroom. Oh, yeah. Shut the door. <laughs> the throne. <laughs> I've had women that work in offices off tell me, they would go into the, the ladies' restroom where there'd be several stalls, and they would actually shut the door and stand on the toilet lid so nobody would know they were in there, and they would pray get their composure back, and then go back to their job. <laughs> Women have to do things <laughs> so that we're not messed up because a messed up woman is going to make a mess. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> we 
We have a tendency to retaliate. It's in us. We have to take authority over it. Psalm 93, 5. Your testimonies are very sure. Holiness, apparent in separation from sin, with simple trust and hearty obedience, is becoming to your house, O Lord, forever. Separated from evil. We're separated from evil and we're coming to God. Both have to happen. Separate from evil but come to God because he's your keeper. So, in the Old Testament, there's a very interesting passage of scripture in Haggai 2, 11 through 13. I've studied this over the years. It's just very interesting to me. So listen to it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest to decide this question of law. So God's talking to his prophet. And this is what he's supposed to ask. If one carries in the skirt of his garment flesh that is holy, because it has been offered in sacrifice to God, and with his skirt are the flaps of his garment, he touches bread or pottage or wine, or oil, or any kind of food, you know, accidentally, does what he touches become holy and dedicated to God's service exclusively? And the priest answered, no. Listen to this. Holiness is not infectious. Holiness is not infectious. What well, as actually, let's say it's you, not a chunk of meat that's been offered on the altar. But you, if you come into holiness, that's between you and God. You can't, even in the laying on of hands, you can't transmit holiness to anyone. You can transmit faith. You can transmit the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Whatever the Lord wants to do, whatever that unction will do. But if a person is to be holy, they must touch the holy one. And that's God Almighty. And from him, what is it? he lives and moves and has his being in us and we in him. He is holy. He's holy. It's set around him all the time. He's holy. And in the church of today, his holiness has been so set aside and the altar has become so polluted and there's so much gray, much less the dark that sets in sometimes. That's why it's so hard to preach. That's why it's so hard to reach the people. The altar has to be cleaned up. And the people have to be cleaned up. God help us to reach them. Only God can break that off of them and open their eyes and open their ears and literally circumcise their hearts and touch them. And I believe with the revival that's coming, we're going to see that happen. Yes. Amen. Now, there's a second part to this. Then said Haggai, if one who is ceremonially unclean because he has come in contact with a dead body should touch any of these articles of food, shall it be ceremonially unclean? And the priest answered, it shall be unclean because unholiness is infectious. Unholiness is infectious. Sin is contagious. Holiness comes only from God. See, that's why it can go so fast. We are to embrace holiness and purity, even if others cannot understand our doing it. Be loyal to your convictions. Loyal to what you've come to believe. Okay. I remember, again, of my husband, just before his death, his sudden death. We didn't know that was coming, but only a matter of a day, a few days. He came through the business office, and he slapped me on the shoulder. And he said, I want you to know that God has spoken to me. And although I don't agree with you, I must agree with him. I am so grateful 
He did that before he suddenly left the planet? Believe me, it was taken care of. It also brought healing to me because I had had to stand my ground. I had had to stand my ground. I remember one morning when the Lord told me what to say to him. And my husband looked at me with fire in his eyes. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. And he was angry. And he said, are you threatening me? Are you trying to intimidate me? And I said, no, this is not your wife talking to you. This is the servant of God to a servant of God speaking. And you either receive it or you don't. It took him a while. It took him a while, but there's sometimes you just absolutely have to stand your ground even with the closest people around you. Mm -hmm. If they really come to God, or if they're already with God, if they grow in the Lord, they will come to an understanding at some point and come back and apologize or make it right. And if they don't, that's not your problem. You stay clean with God. Be loyal to Him. The only reason God says no about some things is because it's not in our best interests or the best interests of the kingdom purposes. It doesn't look like him. <laughs> it's got to be him, okay? And again, there's nothing religious in that whatsoever. He's protecting us from defeat and from some kind of pit or snare the enemy would like to set at our feet. Believe me, when you start proclaiming the gospel, when you start taking a stand as a believer, there's all kinds of things the enemy will try to sneak up and do and put in your pathway. And you have to recognize him. The Holy Ghost will let you recognize him. And you have to know what to cut away, what to say no to, what you can receive, what you can't receive, what you can be a part of, what you can't be a part of, what you can watch, what you can't watch. We've given our lives. They no longer belong to ourselves. Now, I want to look at some verses that Jesus prayed. I love John 17. I'm sure you do too. But let's look at the way he prayed for us before his death on the cross. 15 through 20, John 17. I do not ask that you will take them out of the world, he's talking to Father, but that you will keep and protect them from the evil one. And that's what I pray for every one of you. They are not of the world, worldly and belonging to the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, purify, consecrate, separate them for yourself and make them holy by the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I have also have sent them into the world. And so for their sake and on their behalf, I sanctify and dedicate and consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified, dedicated, consecrated, and made holy in truth. Look what Jesus did for you. Look what he did for me. He consecrated himself so that we might be consecrated. He was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. And he had to absolutely control, and he never committed a sin. But he takes that, and out of his dedication, and out of his consecration, he says, now I want them to have that. Don't tell me you can't live a holy life. Jesus died to let you live a holy life. You can do it. You just have to choose Christ. He has prayed this prayer over us. So we are to trust him. We are to live for him. The blood and the word will keep you. And that's why it's so imperative for everyone to know the word of God for themselves. The blood and the word will keep you. Now, that's the message he wanted to give me. And I know it's heavy out there, but there we are. We are called to be holy equals, if you will. The more an intercessor associates with Jesus Christ and lives by the word, the stronger 
Her prophetic voice will become, the stronger her vision will become, the stronger her hearing in the spirit will become. <coughs> because you're one spirit, mind, and body. You're one. So if you want to go higher in your intercessory ability, if you really want God to not only hear your voice, but answer that cry just like that, live for him. It's just that simple. Live for him. And whatever he brings into your life, it'll be right for you. It'll be right for the kingdom. And it'll produce good fruit. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to switch for a second. And I want to talk about salvation. Because then the Lord did something else. On Tuesday morning, when I had put all this together that we've already been through today, the Lord spoke to me. Well, actually, what I saw, just before I got up, just before I fully opened my eyes, I saw two beams of light crisscrossing and forming a cross in the heavens. I saw it in spirit. And I woke up with that. Well, as soon as I got settled into my prayer chair, I asked the Lord what that was about. And he said, I want you to add to what you've already done that you're going to pray for the lost. So today, in a very special way, 